So welcome everyone. My name is Joyce Raimondo. I'm the education coordinator at the Paula Krasna Houston Study Center. And um, today we have a very special program uh, called Art of Glass with our guest speaker, Isabella Rupp. And we're gonna do this program in two parts. I'm gonna give a little introduction about Pollock and Krasna's mosaic work. And then Isabella is going to share her work and also her studio. So would you like to say hello, Isabella? Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate it. And thank you so much, Joyce and Helen Harrison. I really appreciate the opportunity. Great. And Isabella, you're zooming in from Noyak, right? I am. Yes. So Isabella is an East End artist. We're on the East End of Long Island. And the Polly Krasna House and Study Center is about 100 miles. Um, you just drive straight through Long Island and you will come almost to the end and find us. And Isabella is located a little further north. Okay. So why don't we get started? I always like to relate um, these themes to some of the work of Pollock and Krasner, which is at times a little surprising. We don't usually think of Jackson Pollock as a mosaic artist. So I'm gonna do a screen share and um, show you his one mosaic piece, which is currently on display at the Washburn Gallery in New York City. Um, Actually, it's coming down in a couple of days. So if you could get over there. Okay, so this is where I'm sitting right now in the barn studio of Pollock and Krasner. We're a national landmark and you can visit us, go to pkhouse.org. And we do reopen in May and you can sign up for a tour in person. You could also see all of our other Zoom programs on pkhouse.org, go to the calendar, uh, calendar page. So of course, Pollock is known for his drip painting where he placed the canvas on the floor, worked from all four sides, and he's dripping house paint from sticks to create 100% abstract art. He rises to fame within his own lifetime. And Lee Krasner, his wife, manages his career and she's also an abstract painter eventually. And they both fall into the category of action painting using their whole body moving and the movement is captured on the canvas and it's a very physical way of releasing energy through paint and it, of course it's literally in Pollock's case very fluid so we don't think of Pollock as a mosaic artist do we however this is one of Pollock's the only mosaic that Pollock created and this was created for the WPA it was never installed um, the WPA Works Progress Administration program hired artists to create public works, and both Lee and Pollock were employed full time with a regular, you know, regular wage earners through the program. And what's particularly interesting in this about this mosaic, first off, technically it's not a mural anyway because it's you can move it around, um, but. What we see here is really Picasso's influence on Jackson Pollock, right? You see the, the, the face, for example, the eyes are, you know, kind of twisted, the figure is twisted. It's a direct correlation to um, Picasso and his influence on Pollock's early work. So the Washburn Gallery is located in Chelsea. And if you can get there over the weekend, um, look it up in advance, see if I guess Saturday might be the last day. And it's a treat to see this in real life. This is a mosaic that Lee Krasner created. It's actually a table. It's quite large. And what's interesting is you can see all the mosaic pieces here, the glass pieces, but you can also see, oh, well, maybe it's hard to see. She also embedded found objects like keys. And well, you can see it on the right side then little trinkets. And we still have in the barn studio here, some of the glass from um, this mosaic, which I'll show you in a moment. And when the Pollock mosaic, this one, when it was recently restored, the restorer came into the barn studio and actually used some of the glass that we have here on display. So I'll show you that in a moment. 
Oh. And here is Lee Krasner and her nephew, Ronald Stein, their um, mosaic mural, which is at the Uris Brothers Building, 2 Broadway, Manhattan. And you can see Lee's abstract work come to life as a public, public art. And of course, it's remarkable right now in the subways of New York City, all the amazing mosaic pieces that you can see. And it's, it's really often mosaics, not all the time, but often it's art for the people. It takes the art out of the museum, right? It's for everyone to enjoy. So I'll show you, as I mentioned, I'll just give you a quick walkthrough of the barn. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take off my shoes and put on little slippers. This first part, you can walk with your shoes, but then when you go into the barn studio, you're gonna, if you come in real life, in physical life, you're gonna wear these little booties. And we have other tours where I go in depth, but we wanna to focus today on our guest speaker, Isabella, who's gonna bring this glasswork up to date and she's gonna expand it outside the confines of mosaic to actually painting with glass. So I can't wait to hear what she has to say about that. So this is where this first part of the barn is a storage area. And here, as I was saying, there's Lee Krasner's mosaic pieces. You could even see the green that was probably used in that table, right? So here they are. These are Lee's pigments, by the way, and many of these supplies are left from Lee because she was the last person to use the studio because Pollock died in 1956. Here's Lee Krasner's painting cart. Um, when Pollock used the studio, Lee did not use it simultaneously with Pollock. She used a small room in the house. And then she came in here after his death. Here is the now famous drip painted floor where the accidental paint spilled and splattered. Pollock laid the canvas on the floor and worked from all four sides. Gravity pulled the paint down. As I said, he was an action painter moving his whole body. But you can see from that early mosaic, you can see the movement that's implied, even though the technique was very methodical, placing each piece of glass, right? And that, Eventually, it gives way to the physical aspect of painting, where the paint literally flows, but at the same time, he was painting very carefully. And we have his original house paints that he used left here, and his basters where he would squirt the paint, sticks that would be used as stirs that he painted with, um, and the brushes that he would sometimes use as a stick. Now, after Pollock's untimely death at the age of 44 in 1956, Lee came into the studio and used it as her own. And here she's shown with her paintings on the wall. And I love it when you come in here, you can see where her paint splattered, right, beyond the edge of the canvas. And you can imagine, wow, the energy, how did she get the paint all the way up there, right? And like over here. It's like 16 feet in the air. It's very, um, it's informative and inspiring to come here and see where these two great artists actually produce their groundbreaking abstract expressionist art, what the landscape looked like, what the surrounding areas, and even you can see behind me the incredible light, even on a rainy day, right? So Isabella works a lot with light because she's working with glass. So I don't think you can really separate the two. And I'm curious of what, um, what Isabella is going to tell us about the way she works with light. So I'd like to give an introduction for our guest speaker. So our guest artist, um, Isabella Rupp has been working with glass for 23 years, beginning with cold cut mosaics and expanding to warm glass using kilns and a torch. Isabella paints with glass and light and is here to share with us her work in process along with her experience with mentor Narcissus Quag 
Quaglata. I probably, can you correct me in that when we start? Isabella Studio is in Noyak on the east end of Long Island. So let's give a big welcome to Isabella. Thank you so much, Joyce. I am really happy to be here with you today. And also thank you to Helen Harrison and Paula Krasner House. It's an honor. And uh, I'm really excited to talk about glass. This has been such an opportunity for me to look back. And I even had to find printed photographs and take digital pictures of them uh, from 23 years ago. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen. All right. So I had the uh, wonderful opportunity to stop by the Washburn Gallery to take in the mosaic show. And uh, it was quite fantastic to see up close and personal Jackson Pollock's mosaic, which Joyce just showed us. And I loved seeing the wood on the side using found materials and um, salvaging them. Something that I have loved to do with windows. And then Lee's mosaic, which uh, I believe they made into a table because they needed furniture. So how great to have art that is also functional. Um, the Washburn Gallery is two blocks away from where I used to live in Chelsea. And uh, it was a blast to wander around the neighborhood again. I loved living there. I was in a brownstone, which was five stories, and I lived on the second floor walk up. My apartment was probably 500 square feet and was probably a studio that they divided and created a little bedroom out of. Because the ceilings were 10 feet high, I had a loft bed in the other room, which was quite tiny, and I looked out over 23rd Street between 9th and 10th Avenue. And hanging on my wall for years was this window, 12 panels I bought in Cape Cod for $10 when I was with my dear friend, Joanne, having a little beach trip. And there was something about windows I've always loved. I feel like they hold people's feelings and thoughts because I look out them feeling protected and yet I can see to the outer world. And so, um, I've always been attracted to windows, and I decided to uh, take a little workshop with a wonderful artist in Tribeca, Valerie Carmet, who works with uh, all salvaged uh, dressers and tables, and she cuts up plates and makes these beautiful picassette mosaics, similar to the Lee Krasner table. And um, I met with um, Valerie, and she asked, would you like to work with plates or glass? And I said, oh, I'd really love to work with glass. And I had never worked with glass before. The cool thing with glass is that like Lee's table and Pollock's working on the floor, when you work with glass, you're also working the way that I do with it on a flat table, as opposed to up on an easel as painters work. So there's a different point of view when you're looking down on something. And it's also really cool because one of my work tables is in the center of the studio and I can walk around what I'm working on and see it from different angles, which will often change the way that I'm working on a composition. And so this is the first mosaic that I made. And I would wander down once a week to Valerie's studio and when I first got there, she said, oh, do you want to do a drawing? And I said, no, I just want to learn how to cut glass and do my thing. And she said, okay. And the third week, I'll never forget her just kind of standing and watching me do my thing. And she said, uh, you have found home, Isabella. And uh, I, I had, I really felt that way. It's like glass found me. And while I was living in Chelsea um, on New Year's Eve of 2000, there was this huge blizzard. It was like a whiteout. 
And instead of staying snug in my apartment, my good friend MJ, who lived a block away, we both got our hats and coats and boots on and we wandered down to Chelsea Piers, which had just recently been built. And we found a few places that were open and stopped and had some beers and looked out at the Hudson River. And she said, you know, Isabella, there's a great place a block away from us that you should see if you can rent and have a show. And it was called H2K at the time. It had all these cool windows in the front. And we wandered in, they were open and, you know, I was kind of nervous. All I had made was one mosaic. And um, MJ and I talked to the manager. He said, come back. And um, I met with the woman who was choosing artists. And she said, we do shows here every month for artists. And we throw a party for you and send out invitations. And so I said, you know, great. You know, here's one of my, one of my, as if I had more than one pieces of work. And she said, when can you be ready? And I said, with a big deep breath, 90 days. And so I had 90 days to create. And I was planning a trip to meet my dear friend, Savannah from North Carolina. We were going to meet at a club med in Cancun and sitting on the beach. I was then named Nancy and Savannah was then named Carol. And we were both reading a book by a woman named Francesca. And we were saying, God, isn't that a cool name? Like, and we were both saying, you know, I've really been thinking about changing my name. And with an art show coming up and having to sign my work, I felt like, yeah, a name is important. And I was never named after anybody because I was the second girl in 79 years. I was supposed to be Joseph. So they didn't even have a name for me. So they named me Nancy because it was a popular name in that time. And so I said to Savannah, hey, we're at a club med. No one knows us. How about I become Isabella? You become Savannah. And that's what we did. And we introduced ourselves that way. And then when I got back to New York, MJ and I designed my invitation. She created it. And I got to work on some new work. I had 90 days. So my invitation was not only an invite to my first art show in Chelsea, but it was also a coming out for my name. Please join Isabella Rupp, aka Nancy, for her debut exhibit. So um, I'm not really sure what my family thought. I think I forewarned my parents, which was good. <laughs> and then Isabella was the same as Elizabeth, which was my grandmother's name, who I was very close with. So the one quote we put in the invitation was, tiles of carnelian, lapis and jade, the muralist sets her picture, one centimeter at a time, every piece alone is precious, together they make a priceless whole. And that's how I felt when I was making mosaics, that each piece was precious and each one decided what other piece it wanted to live next to. So I came back to my studio and underneath the loft, I moved all the furniture out to the living room. I put a table where the stressor is and that's where I went to work. Everything moved out of here. And of course I had this one mosaic and then I started having two. This piece was called Sedona, three, this was Milky Way. I decided instead of having all the glass meet with grout, which is similar to what Pollock and Krasner used, cement, I wanted glass to free float. And so the type of glue became much more critical. And I did a lot of glue experiments as a result. I also added fabric. There's like a, a shiny sort of silver fabric on the back of this and some dimensional components that I bought. I painted on the back and then I used some flame worked components, which you make with a torch. And then this was a found bottle at the beach. This is another piece that I used fabric on the back for to give another dimension. I didn't want the sky to be as dense as everything else, but I also didn't want it to be just clear glass. So the, sh the sheen of the fabric really took good care of that. And this was my cityscape. 
also with some fabric puffing out on the back. And then two sculptures that were set in petrified wood. And the show was a huge success. It nearly sold out and commissioned with work ranging in price from $1,200 to $4,500. It was a blast and it was a complete group effort. Uh, so many people helped me in order to make that happen. And soon I realized my apartment was a little too small because my art was expanding and I needed a studio space. And I decided it was time to leave Manhattan and looked all around and decided that me and my cats, Bessie and Edward, would be moving to Southampton. And the big thing was, how are they going to adjust from an apartment to a home? And they did just fine. They seemed to really enjoy seeing all the animals outside. And when I was looking for houses, realtors would say, do you want a pool? And I would say, no, no, no. All I want is a two-car garage because all I wanted was a studio and I could start with a two-car garage. And initially it housed windows among other things. And of course I had future plans for when I could afford to convert it. So now it was time to look for windows because I don't work with canvases that I can go and buy at an art store. The windows have to be found. And my dad was one who went dumpster diving on my behalf, looking for windows and found some great ones. And I collected and collected. And then people started giving me these beautiful windows and I started storing them as my canvases so that I could be free to work and not have to go out and try to find a window. And now I just was working in one of the, the spare bedroom in my home because I couldn't afford to convert the garage. So I would paint on the back. The lower part of this has some textural paint like sand and I use some shells and stones as well as the glass. And I would keep track of where the windows came from. This came from Montauk out on Hither Hills at a place I used to love to stay before I moved out here. And these came from Chelsea and I made my cityscape for myself in these, the Twin Towers. Sweet little windows. They were the first thing I set up when I moved. And I was fortunate when I got here to be really welcomed by the community. I was part of a, a two-person show that was curated by Catherine Newman at the Bryant Library through the Art League of Long Island. I was in a um, show curated, a juried show by Sarah Nightingale and Tom Ares and Michael Chiarello. And my piece won first prize. This is not the first becoming Isabella because I would not sell her. Five people really wanted to buy. And I said, no, it really is a significant piece for me. And I named it becoming Isabella, by the way, because I was becoming more of who I really am as I was diving into my art and renaming myself. I did two commissions of that piece, thanks to the first show. And um, this was an additional one with eight panels as opposed to 12 in the original. And Helen Harrison wrote um, an article in the New York Times uh, about the Siena Spirituality Show. And there was a picture of my piece in it, which was really a treat. The Elaine Benson Gallery and Sculpture Garden, just an amazing place out here. I was real fortunate to be part of a show there. And in Oshawa Hall, a metal and glass show that was curated by James DeMartis, and of course the art studio tour of the Hamptons with um, the beautiful East End Art, art League out here. And my two nephews, Frank and Bob, came out and helped me during that studio tour, and we had a blast. So I began expanding and exploring more with paint, as well as dimensional objects in the work. And I decided I really wanted to be able to make my own objects as opposed to buying them. So the beads, the white beads around the head and the, the pink area here in the heart, these were all made with a torch. And so 
I decided I really wanted to pursue the torch. And I was very fortunate to be accepted to Pilchuck Glass School out in Washington. Dale Chihuly was one of the founding artists of Pilchuck School. Quite an awesome place. There's the hot shop down on the left side. Very peaceful environment in the woods. And I made all of my own objects, really planning to incorporate them into the windows. I wanted waves to curl out at you and clouds to puff up. So that's what uh, we did. And it was really fun because the teacher, Karl Ittig from Germany, was used to making traditional vases, um, ornaments with the torch. And I'm saying, I want to make sun rays and waves. And he was great and really into using this uh, tool in a different way. And the needle of the torch is like a paintbrush. It can be very thin. It can be puffy. You control that. And that impacts the glass the same way that the point of a, of a paintbrush impacts a canvas. These are some of the objects that I made while I was out at Pilchuck. And then when I came back, I incorporated some of them into some more mosaics. This piece is called Breach and was in an Oshawa, show, Oshawa Hall show that Ellen Dooley curated. I liked the melting dimensionality, the textural flow of this glass looking like mountains. I loved the reflection of the glass on the wall. It had a life of its own. All day long, it changes, never the same, which I also really love. While at Pilchuck, I also investigated how they stored everything. Because in my mind, I'm thinking, I want a studio. How am I gonna organize this studio? Because with glass, it's a pretty complex setup because it involves equipment. It involves ventilation. Um, it involves what I learned, having lots of tables with wheels on them. And so it was fantastic. I, I got a lot out of my time there. And then I drew up my first studio plan. And I was planning also to go to Corning next, which I was very fortunate to attend. And Harry Seaman, who was um, the head of the um, studio there, and he's also a teacher, kindly looked at my studio layout for me and gave me his feedback, which was real helpful. Corning is also just an extraordinary, extraordinary place to be involved in and to take classes at. And I also took notes and pictures on how they set up their studio space so that when I got home, I would have some idea of what to do in order to keep track of what kind of glass I was working with where. Even down to the tools, how do they stand them up and organize them? So tweaked my studio plan thanks to Harry's help and my research at both schools. And then the first step in the studio was putting in three windows so some natural light could come in. More plans for electric and lights, as well as carpentry. And then now we're going to make this garage into a functional working space. So we started with another triangular window. And then putting in new doors and now the equipment. My first kiln from Denver Kilns, Holly Morrison, the owner, brilliant woman. This was custom made for me and shipped from Denver. And a second kiln for the flame working, custom made also with special doors that enable you to keep your glass from cracking while you continue to work on it at the torch. Everything was done with great care for safety, ventilation, and the studio was coming and taking form and shape. My dear friend Jane was a part of every step of the way. She's also an incredibly talented artist. And she insisted that the splash behind the sink have some of my mosaics. So she painted tiles, gave them to me and said, do some mosaic on these, Isabella. And it's just such a treat to have them. And she also made a plexi table with a light box under it 
so that I could see what the glass looked like as I was working. She did all the drawings for the torch bench, the table, the work table. And here I am at my torch booth with my torch. Very exciting to finally have a functioning studio. And went back to Pilchuck a second time, which was again, such a treat. And this time I was going to be studying with Leonor Torres from Australia on something called glassimations. It was the first time offering at Pilchuck. And I was sculpting and casting and creating video animations and projections with eight other artists. And it was something else, learning the cold shop, how you clean up glass, how you polish glass, the different decisions that you make about that. I decided to create a lens in the center of this heart where the video would animate through and leave the rest frosted. Then created a metal stand with the help of the metal group. And behind this, there was a, a little animating onion that I created. In addition to that, we made other sculptures and these sculptures we projected onto. And this was something else to just see how what you were doing with the glass impacted the quality of the projection. And I realized that Pilchuck has a gallery show at the end of everyone's stay there. And we only had one projector. And I suggested, hey, this was the day before the gallery show. How about we shoot everybody's work? I'll edit something together. And then we can project everyone's work because otherwise we couldn't have only projected one person's work. So we ended up doing that. And this is another artist's work um, that was part of the show, Charlotte. And um, Deirdre, the assistant, helped edit all of this together. And it was quite an undertaking. And um, we projected it on the walls and ceiling of the gallery at Pilchuck, along with our other sculptures with the animations happening behind them. When all was uh, done the next day, Ruth King, who was the um, artistic director at um, Pilchuck, came to see me and said she just really loved the film and wanted to use it for their auction, which was quite an honor. Next stop, Urban Glass in Brooklyn. Um, fabulous place as well. I um, was awarded two scholarships there. And here I was studying with Miguel Unsen, combining the torch with the kiln. So the pieces you make with the torch become like brush strokes. And then I created a, a composition and then they melt together onto a background in the kiln. It's another piece, just those brush strokes. It's really wild to see what the heat does. It has a life of its own, which is what I love about it. And then I just returned from Urban where I was taking another great class um, that was casting, sculpting, and inclusions. And I just did a quick time-lapse of making a plaster silica mold. You have to be real careful with venting, particularly breathing in the silica. And I'm pouring it into another mold. And finishing up here, once it's the right consistency, pouring it on in. And then glass covers this plaster silica mold. And I will post some pictures once I'm all done with them, still in process. This was my mitten, using that for another open face mold. And that just finished cooking at Urban, 36 hours in the kiln. And this is me with that mold, filling it with glass that has to be measured.
and then in the kiln. And finally, bullseye. Bullseye is like the Rolls Royce of glass makers. They test everything so that when you're working with bullseye glass fusing, you can fuse multiple times. And the beauty of that is you can go into a piece and you can add dimensionality, texture, highlights. Here's my studio with lots of bullseye powder. This is my beginnings of a palette. This powder, which is ground glass, you can sift with different sized sifters. And then also the, the glass is ground to be like little pebbles and stones, three different, four different sizes. This is sheet glass that you can cut and work with, rod and stringer, which is like thin spaghetti. I do test sheets, a lot of test sheets to see how the material is going to look when combined. And I began painting with glass using fusing kilns, which are just like ovens, sifting powders and fritz onto blank pieces of glass that are canvases. And I'm able to get dimensionality, sometimes using more than one panel, sometimes adding dimensionality to the top and front of a panel, using enamels and pigments in addition to the powders and frit metals, gold, silver. So just exploring these different worlds and letting the material guide me. This is a two-part piece that I made. My husband um, hand makes these beautiful frames. This has what's called vitrograph, this bent material here in it. And you can see through from one pane to the next. It's a triptych hanging in a room with another piece. And here are some details. This frame was made with a rhododendron from our property. I love the reflection of the glass on the walls and the way the light plays with it. It changes all day long. Here are three panes of glass designed so that you can see from one through to the next. This was at the church in Sag Harbor for a wonderful uh, fundraiser for the Ukraine. April Gornick and Eric Fischel um, put together April Really, we, we raised, I believe, all the artists like a hundred something, a hundred twelve or thirteen thousand dollars. Phenomenal. And this was a piece I participate in Guild Hall's um, show every year for uh, members. And this was the show in 2020. The opening was days before everything shut down for COVID. We didn't quite yet know what was going on yet. And the guest juror for that show um, was from um, the Museum of Modern Art. And uh, what's cool is they come in and they don't really know anybody. And I think there were about 470 pieces in the show and they award, I think they awarded 13 um, uh, prizes and I was given an honorable mention, which was really really cool. I was psyched to be part of the group. And it was a wonderful show. And then everything changed. Um, my job ended, my husband and his partner had to close their business. And we moved my 93 year old mother in with us to help care for her. And then the beauty of COVID is it introduced Zoom. So Narcissus Quagliata, who is um, a glass master, he is like what Beethoven is to classical music. He is to kiln forming and fusing. He is a painter of watercolor and a painter of glass. And he decided that 
he was going to start giving Zoom classes. This is his um, dome. It is the largest in the world in Taiwan. He also has a dome in Rome um, in Michelangelo, is it Michelangelo, Michelangelo's church, I believe. And so he started a Zoom class on the business of art, which I decided to take and got to know him and really respect him. And one of the people in our class said, hey, would you critique our work? And he said, oh, I don't know if I want to. And a lot of people were interested. So we said, look, send your CVs, send images and um, a paragraph why you want, you would like this and I'll interview you. So I had a half an hour interview with him on Zoom and realized this was somebody who I really wanted to learn from. He just turned 80 this year and is a master in so many ways as a human being, uh, as an artist and as a business person. And he's uh, also teaching classes. So I was invited to be part of this um, critique program for a year. There are nine of us in my group and it's been um, an extraordinary experience in so many ways. In addition to that, he started teaching other classes where he's sharing his methods for the first time with people. And he takes the raw material that comes from Bullseye and transforms it. So this is some of what I've been learning to do, which is basically to make my own palette that I then go back and make work with. So these are all materials that have been transformed using the heat and various layouts and kilns so that instead of taking the raw material that comes out of the shop, you take that and that's just your starting point to then make your own palette. So these are pieces that I made that I will then cut up and then I will then make a piece, a composition using the glass that I've made. These are all powders that became a sheet of glass and just create these amazing little worlds using glass powders. And then frit, learning how to manipulate frit so that you can create lace is just mind-bendingly interesting and challenging. And this was my first kiln fall, which I was really happy with. And here's some more lace. Again, these are pieces that can either be cut up or fused again onto backgrounds with other material filling the lace. The colors can all mix and blend together. Whereas with stained glass or mosaic, the colors don't mix like this because they're not introduced to heat and you also have to know how to manipulate and work with it. This is brought to a different temperature. This is a much cooler fuse, a hotter fuse. Just like the torch, the amount of heat you use impacts the way the glass flows and the way that it looks. More textural in a tack fuse, which is a lower heat, more flowing with higher heat, logical. And then I took the lace and decided to make bigger objects here, a wave and a sun. I love the way these colors mix and blend and melt together. The foam of the wave, the heat of the sun. The Milky Way, bringing us into the orbit of pinks and purples and blues. And this is Narcissus's Buddhist teacher from many decades ago, Suzuki Roshi. Uh, this is a stained glass piece that is in um, the collection of, of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So I learned um, not only did I share an interest in glass with him, but also in Buddhism, um, my teacher, Geshe Kelsang Gyatso, 
Um, I love this quote. We are all interconnected in a web of kindness from which it is impossible to separate ourselves. And my journey with this material um, has certainly shown me that. And my learnings in um, my Buddhist practice have, have just been um, a life changer in every way imaginable. And they introduced me to this guy, Steve Rossborough, who was from Canada, filling in for our teacher, Gen Norden, uh, when she was in England for teacher training in the summer. She asked him to fill in for her. And he was leading a meditation at Channing Daughters out here. It's this beautiful vineyard. And um, we walked out after the meditation and there was a tree house. And I said, oh my God, I've always wanted a tree house. And he said, well, I'll build it for you. And I was like, are you kidding? And he said, no, I've been researching these because he had property in Canada and he was going to build meditation huts. So we began to design a tree house and I started working with the windows, salvaged windows from the barn that I picked out that we designed the tree house around. I worked in my studio and he worked out in the woods and we just created it starting with the salvaged windows and designed around that. And then he built around that. And we were just friends, enjoying getting to know each other, talking about Buddhism, building this tree house. I was working with some of the windows that were going to be put in. This is Green Tara. And I will show you, here is a walk. This is um, our backyard and this is a glass wall. These are these beautiful glass fences that I make that give you privacy without blocking the outer world. And Steve custom builds the framing for all of them so that I can make whatever I want. And the beauty of the glass is that it doesn't obstruct what's behind it. It connects to it. It doesn't overpower it, it dances with it. And all of this glass is handmade from those crushed powders and frit that I was showing you earlier. Some chunks of sheet glass as well, some enamels. And the cool thing with these fences is that whether you're looking at them from the front or if you're looking at them from behind, they look great either way. There really is no specific front or back. The front is more dimensional for sure, but they, they can be viewed from either side. And here's a wonderful walkway that Steve built going out to the treehouse. And this is our meditation hut. We uh, have enough room for two of us and we added a front porch. We, he added a front porch <laughs> so that we'd have some more space. And um, I'm actually walking with this camera. I got my first selfie stick and uh, it's really amazing. It's not far from the house, but you really feel like you're in a whole other world being up in this little tree house. And there's green Tara. I airbrushed the round circle behind her and the one around her head. Those doors are from Shelter Island. And I've also incorporated dimensional components that I made with the torch. And there are also some metal pieces as well. And it's great in the winter. It's been out for years, no problem with snow, rain. It's all the beauty of glass. It can be indoor or outdoor. And then here's our little tree house inside with meditation cushions and the other Buddha, Vajrayogini. I used all different kinds of glass 
There's some salvaged glass going around her. There's some flame worked pieces as well. Those little white round ones are made with the torch. There's some metal components as well. And I like how you can see Tara in that window. And it's just a really cozy little space. And Steve and I got married, <laughs> surprise. Um, something that was a surprise to me for sure. Um, our relationship changed and I think the treehouse and certainly our learning together in Buddhism had a big impact on us and still does. My mom and dad were both with us, which was fantastic for the ceremony in Northport, also Long Island, which is where I grew up. And now our final piece here, Steve opened up a business with his partner, Victor, called Hamptons Float, which is in Watermill. They are um, a beautiful spa with sensory deprivation tanks and an infrared sauna. And I was commissioned to make these panels for their lounge so that people could feel private and safe when they came out of floating without the natural light being blocked by curtains or shades. Most of this glass I've made, made from those powders and frits. Some I've used sheet glass, but very little. The bubbles are intentional in the clear glass. We wanted it to feel like you're underwater. And Steve also made this table using some of my glass pieces. This is it at night. Um, I really wanted it lit. And thanks to Alan Blacher, a phenomenal lighting designer and Barry Minerly, a great engineer and my husband who built these frames, designed them so that each panel can be taken out without crushing the lights. And these are just a few details of the glass that I all handmade. And that's it. Thank you so much for being here with me and for taking the time to share this. I really appreciate it. Isabella, that was above and beyond. Like I know every single person here is just like blown away. Um, you are so sweet. <laughs> oh, it's true. Well, first off, your work, I learned so much. It's so stunning. Mm. And then your process and seeing it evolve. And also the way you put together the presentation itself is like a mini documentary and it was like riveting. I'm sure a lot of people feel that way. It was so enjoyable to see your life and your work evolved and, and expand. It's, it's remarkable. Mm. And then to see the relationship to Jackson Pollock where you're working with the accidental in part with the glass painting and and yet the final result is this transparent form it's absolutely beautiful and you have a lot of compliments um the wholeness of the presentation is beautiful thank you ever so much fabulous work amazing i'd love to visit float so what's the website for float you know? It, it, yes, it is hamptonsfloat.com. And what's your website? Isabellarupp.com. If you want, Isabella, you could type that into the chat. Oh, thank and you. If anyone's interested in a commission or learning more about Isabella's work, you can contact you through the website, right? Absolutely. And Joanne says, truly outstanding work. So happy to have been with you on your journey. Fantastic, thank you for sharing. Any questions? How did you get the bubbles in the glass? Elaine Rupp. <laughs> Great question, Elaine. Um, the 
material that is my canvas is called Tecta. It's a clear glass made by Bullseye. And Tecta has one smooth side and one rough side. And I actually ran various tests and showed the bubbles to Victor and Steve because we that you actually get different patterns depending upon how you sandwich the glass together and what temperature you take it to. And Seema says, what sort of Buddhist path do you follow? Uh, it's, it's Kadampa Buddhism. And my teacher is from Tibet. Mm -hmm. And Lisa says, do you teach any workshops? Not at the moment, but in the future, I would like to very much. Okay. And if they want to follow you, do you have an Instagram or anything like that? I sure do. I sure do. And, and you know what? I'll, I'll also put that in the, um, the chat. It's, it's my name. It's uh, at Isabella Rupp with not a hyphen, but I don't know what that's called. The lower hyphen. I don't know. Yeah. An underscore. Thanks, Joyce. Yes, I'll, I'll put it in the chat. Okay, thank you. And um, do you have any work where you're, any place, an art gallery where it could be seen physically right now or just online? At the moment, it's online and we are um, readying for an outdoor exhibit this summer. Nice. Yeah. And it looks like a lot of people would be interested in mosaic classes. <laughs> so <Cool. laughs> of course, because it was so inspiring. And um, we're going to have to wrap up. But Isabella, seriously, I, I've known Isabella for many years. And I really didn't realize the depth and breadth of your work. So this was such a pleasure, really, to see you on your journey. Um, as a human being and your spirituality and how that wove together with your enthusiasm for art creativity in this particular medium. It's outstanding. It's absolutely outstanding. So um, any closing remarks? Isabel? I just, I just want to thank you, Joyce and, and Helen and Paula Krasner, because this has been such an amazing and everybody who's here today. It just has meant so much to me. And it really helped me to look at the last 23 years. I, I mean, I was like, holy moly, this has been a journey. And it helped me see that for myself. So I, I really appreciate that. Amazing. Thank you. Um, also, I'd like to announce after this uh, recording on Zoom is edited, it's going to be posted on my YouTube channel. If you Google YouTube Joyce Raimondo, it will bring you to my channel. We also have 42 other videos on there of past Zoom uh, programs. And if you do like the video, then please do hit the like button and subscribe to the channel so you could support the uh, YouTube channel. That would be very helpful. And um, also, of course, go to Isabella's website to see more of her work. And everybody have a wonderful day or a wonderful evening, wherever you are, and just keep being creative. And it's, it's so nice to see so many interested people from all over the world on Zoom today. So thank you. Thank you, thank Isabella. You. Thank you so much, Joyce. Thank you, everyone. Thank